And if I'm being faithful where I am and I am, you know, living out my Christian walk and I'm being responsible in all three spheres, right? He's given us the family. He's given us the church. Mm. He's given us the civil government. If I'm being faithful in those three spheres and I am effectively living out my Christian convictions in those three spheres, then number one, it is going to be inevitable that I'm going to do some culture warring, mm. right? There we go. Um, because if they hated Christ, they will hate us, right? Mm -hmm. So again, faithfulness in those three spheres will lead me to the battle. And now it's time for another interview on the Babylon Bee Podcast. Hey guys, Kyle here. Recently, I spoke to over 500 Lutherans at the Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference at Concordia University, Chicago. I had a great experience. You wouldn't think that an entire room full of Lutherans would be any fun. But trust me, they were a hoot. We had a blast talking about everything from serious theological topics to lighter issues, like jokes and what God has done for us by giving us humor, all kinds of fun stuff that we got to do, and they were just an absolute blast. Well, Issues Etc. is a podcast and syndicated radio talk show, and it covers all kinds of topics from culture and worldview to theology, apologetics, ethics, philosophy, law, and culture. Issues Etc. has been educating, equipping, and edifying Christians for almost 30 years, and they have my highest recommendation. Listen at issuesetc.com or at your favorite podcast provider. That's issuesetc.com to start listening today. Go Lutherans! Thank you guys for tuning in to the interview show here at the Babylon B podcast. With me, as always, is Sam Greer. I'm Jared Lemaster, and with us today is Vody Bakum. Yes, sir. And we are really blessed to have you. This is like a big honor. I'm happy to be in the hive, man. <laughs> yes, I like that. I like calling it the hive. I think that's a really good one. I, I think that's an appropriate name. It is a hive of activity around here most of the time. Not today so much, but... Yeah, I'm hoping it wasn't like yeah. people found out I was coming and they They're just... Like, mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that Bodhi. I got things to do. We just wrapped up June. Did you do anything special to celebrate yeah. Pride Month? Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's good. absolutely nothing. I, I, I waited until it was over to come back. I, I to, accidentally to attended two Pride events. And I didn't mean to. I went to the Dodger game on that Friday. Oh. That was that, and I didn't know. Oh. My friend got me tickets. Yeah, yeah. And um, we just decided to go. And it happened to be the time when the Sisterhood of the Perpetual yeah. Indulgence. Yeah. And then I have. I was in New York City in Times Square with the when they did the Pride March, and I didn't know that it was that day either. I think so everybody I, ought to see one. Uh, well. I've seen a lot of uh, jock straps. I think everybody. <laughs> I'm serious. I think pe a lot people of have no are. idea. Yeah, people have no idea the debauchery. Oh wow! That surrounds yeah. those events, and I, I think if people knew, um, even when the news covers those events, yeah. they 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 don't cover that part. You get the sanitized pictures, um, partly because you know. They, they the can't. FC, yeah, yeah, the FCC wouldn't, it's, wouldn't it's allow it. It's you know? pornographic. <laughs> exactly. They yeah, wouldn't allow you, right. you know, to show that stuff. But also to sanitize it, you know, yeah. so that people think, no, this is just, you know, wholesome. We want to be like everybody else. and talk. No, it's it's not that. Um, no. Yeah, it's so. gross, man. <laughs> it was yeah. gross. It was terrible. Well, we're glad you're here yeah. with us now. Yeah. We're in beginning of July. Yes. It's also a Monday. Mm -hmm. I know you lean Sunday Sabbatarian, correct? Yes. Now, let me ask, if you, uh, well, first off, if you're bench pressing on a Sunday, is it work? Depends on how much is on the bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how much is on the bar for yeah. you? It depends on how, how much can you put up these days? It depends on how many, it depends on how many wheels you have on there, you know? Okay. Any, 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 anything more than two wheels, you know? <laughs> I think got, that's what the Sadducees you, said. You got three wheels on yeah. there, four wheels on there, I'm going to say you're working. Yeah. Yeah. The Pharisees were, yeah, they they would say that too. I think that was part yeah, of the yeah, thirty-nine. Yeah. But if you're doing sit-ups after the sun I has think gone that's down, actually, in the book of hesitations, <laughs> that's in the first first hesitation, yeah, yeah. not second hesitations. Yeah. That's right, first hesitations. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I was just reading about Jesus. He said, "My father and I have been working from the beginning." Yeah, <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah. So he probably was lifting a lot on those days. But in all seriousness, um, yeah. we're we're glad you're healthy and still putting up weight. Yeah. Can you back up a hair? Two years ago, a lot of us tuned in and paid attention yeah. when your heart issues happened. Can you unpack how that affected you theologically? Did you have more trust in God? What happened there? Yeah. Um, there was. Those were some interesting times. 
And from a theological perspective, it 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 wasn't like, you know, my theology changed. It was more like it was confirmed, mm. right? And and we were encouraged because of what we had, you know, constantly been reminding ourselves of and what I've been constantly teaching, both publicly and in my home. Um, it, it was it was comforting to not have to change my theology during mm. that time. Yeah. It was comforting to not have to try to go and find something, you know, that was suitable for the occasion. Um, and so it, it, it was more of a time of, of confirmation. Um, I, I tell you what, Paul's words, you know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Um, and, and that whole section there where he's dealing with the benefits of staying and the benefits of going and, um, you know, being a father with children still in the house and grandkids coming and things of that nature. I mean, it was, there was a lot of that thinking, um, but but the Lord was the Lord was kind, man. Mm-hmm. I, I've often told people the story of you know my wife having a conversation with someone. You know, there I'm, I'm in the hotel room, and people try to be encouraging. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of people were saying, no, you know, he's gonna make it. You know, the Lord's using him. The Lord's not done with him. You know, all the things that he's doing, yada yada yada. And I just remember, remember my wife in a conversation saying, no, the Lord's no man's debtor, <laughs> and he doesn't need Vody. Right, yeah. so I mean, I I don't want him to go, but but you know, if he, the Lord didn't need him, you know, mm-hmm. and and I was like, good for you, wow. good for you, but that's you tough, yeah, but yeah. you, that's a tough place to come to, yeah. And so when you're saying your theology was solid, what, how exactly do you mean, like in terms of your health or in terms of God's providence or yeah, his in terms sovereignty? Of God's pro- yeah, in terms of God's providence, yeah, yeah, in terms of His sovereignty, yeah. um. Just you know, in in terms of all of those things, um, mm. and it was it was really it was amazing. We got to see um, God's just kind providences mm. in that whole process, um, you know, and, and just in things that happened when and how they needed to happen for me to get the the, the care that I needed. Wow. Um, I, I showed up at Mayo within an hour or two of my death. Oh wow! You know, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I'm glad they didn't tell me that for the first day. <laughs> they didn't tell me that for the first day or so, you know. But a couple of days in, you know, they were like, "Yeah, you were in stage. You, you were, were, you were dead. You were done." How long? Oh, how long were you dead? dead? What's that? <laughs> how long were you dead? Do you know? How long was I dead? Oh, I thought you said no, in my no, death. no, 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 no. Oh, no, it within, happened. within a couple of hours of it. Not that I was oh, dead I was for a couple say, I thought hours. You had, like, I thought you were going to tell us an NDE story. Oh, like, no, 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 Like one of those little kids that die. Bestseller. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, you a best had a fault line heaven, is, heaven is for real, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bodie no. Bauckham. No, yes, that that story, not that. Well, we're grateful you're still here and still yeah. in good health. Your nine children, I'm sure, are grateful. And one of the ways you stay in shape is something you have in common oh, with yeah. Jared, can we, Brazilian can we talk about jiu-jitsu. This? Yeah, yes. talk, talk about, about it. BJJ, yes. like yes. How, uh, how have you, uh, how, what belt are you? Like how long have you studied? Where did you study? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I'm interested. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you a Carlos Gracie Jr. guy? I started in 2012. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and it was just kind of, again, a providential thing. My oldest son, um, the last four, four and a half years of his education, we homeschool. Yeah. Uh, he traveled with me full time. Cool. And then, you know, when he was done, um, you know, he was off doing a bunch of different things and and we just missed each other, mm-hmm. you know? And so he started looking into different martial arts stuff and, you know, we talked about that from a theological perspective. Yeah. And so we found Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as you know, doesn't have the theological background. Right, because yeah. of, because of the way it originated and where it came from, it doesn't it doesn't have a theological background. Yeah, there's no like spiritual component. No. Yeah, there's no, no meditation, no. no Eastern mysticism. No. Right. Yeah. And your your black belts are called professor. Yep. You know, not master or sensei or they're called yeah. professor. You know. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we started doing that, and I was like a duck in water. It's man. the best, it right? Was, it was the best. And it was the most challenging thing that I had ever done in my life. Uh-huh. It was amazing how, you know, being a big, strong guy, that, you know, I'm the biggest, strongest guy in there, but I can't handle any of these guys <laughs> who've been here for a while, yeah. right? Yeah. Which just confirmed everything that I needed to know about it. And so right. um, I, I reached uh, Blue Belt, which 
again, for for people who don't know about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's you know, hard. It takes it takes a couple of years <laughs> yeah. to to get your blue belt. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and then after that we moved to Lusaka and there's nowhere to train. There's no BJJ there. So I was Jeez. there for a few years and just would train here, there, the other. So I'm a blue belt forever. And then we started the first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy in Zambia. Wow. Um, oh. And so, do you have professors there? Are you teaching? Like I was. I was it. I was really? it. Oh. Very so cool. you know, our you know my my professor in in Houston, Travis Took, uh-huh. uh, he got his black belt under Carlos Gracie Jr. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so that's that's, that's that is my lineage. Interestingly enough, that you mentioned. Yeah. It. Um, and so you know, he kind of you know mentored me from afar, and sure. you know we became kind of a satellite and used their curriculum yeah. and all oh. that. And so I earned that's my purple ridiculous. belt. You know, okay. Um, and and then the world ended. Um, yes. COVID hit. Right. Um, and then my heart. <laughs> <it's just laughs> right. um, so I haven't been able to. I've been on the mats a couple of times. Okay. You know, since then, but we lost our building. Shoot. And you know all of that. So yeah, again, I've been doing it for wow a, a decade, but I'm I'm still purple because out of that decade, mm. probably half of it. Yeah. I haven't been you know, you know training. But that's not uncommon. Like no. I used to think a lot of people no. have to take time off. They go yeah. through things, you get little injuries here and there. The average is something so, like ten years to 10 get a black to, belt. Ten to twelve. Yeah, yeah like 10 I was to 12 like, years it's so average. crazy. Yeah. My the guy that first started teaching me got his black belt under Hoist Gracie. Yeah. And then I switched over to a um Gracie Baja gym, mm-hmm. which is kind of it's more like a belt factory. I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but <laughs> it is. They, it's easier to get your your blue yeah. and stuff. They have a structure, and yes, you know, yes, like it's yes, good yes, for yes, kids because yes. you like can yes, get the, you know yes. every month you get a new stripe. I got a question for both of you because yeah. I have no BJJ background. You want us to roll right now? I want you to roll. I'm no, how have you, how have you avoided cauliflower ear? You've both got intact oh, yeah. ears, and I thought that was the thing with BJJ. Yeah. They give you your black belt, and then they box your ears it's for a while. Hered- it's hereditary, I think. If, is it? it? Yeah. Well, I don't. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah. there are. Yeah, there. Are, yeah. There, there are some guys who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Exactly. I, I think my ears have grown since. Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like yeah, bigger. Just keep people off your head, man. <laughs> just keep <laughs> people true. off your head. And a lot of those tend to be guys who have wrestling backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. that's true. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of those yeah. guys tend to have more wrestling okay. backgrounds. And do more no gi stuff, um, you know, because the, the gi that they you oh know, that you wear. got it and and um, the bathrobe, yeah, the bathrobe that you, that you roll around with other men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so instead yeah. of getting grabbed on the gi, they grab you by the ears. So here's, it's here's a very manly sport. The, it, it is an incredibly manly sport. Now <laughs> I've talked about this uh, often. You know, men, especially in this day mm-hmm. where masculinity is marginalized, um, men look for things that are masculine. And ironically, um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is incredibly masculine, but not for the reason people think. Mm -hmm. You know, for one thing, um, there is this sense of of discipleship and mentoring. That's the only way you advance, Mm -hmm. right? Is you have to humble yourself. Yes, you do. (laughs) You have to humble yourself, um, which is something that men need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the the other thing is that there's there's technical mastery, right? Mm -hmm. And men are, you know, they're all about, you know, technical mastery. The other thing is it is the highest expression of gentleness. It's Mm -hmm. referred to as the gentle art, right? In most martial arts, you use maximum force Mm -hmm. to subdue your opponent. Mm -hmm. You hit him as hard as you can. You kick him as hard as you can. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is designed around the idea of using the minimum amount of force necessary to Mm. subdue an opponent, right? You, you use the least amount of energy and the least amount of effort necessary yeah. to s- subdue an opponent. And it is the epitome of strength and power under control. Yeah. And so you can have people of various sizes and, you know, all this kind of stuff who are, who are sparring with one another. Um, and men, men are attracted to that. Mm-hmm. And not to mention the fact that it's just, it's just, it's the toughest workout. It is you'll... really hard. <laughs> it really no, yeah, I'm is. drenched. I'm yeah, drenched in yeah, sweat. So absolutely. I have four boys. We're all doing it. Yeah. So my, me and my four boys are all doing it. And what I always teach them, you have to learn how to lose well. Yes. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the biggest lessons that you can learn doing any kind of sport. But I think in particular, for um, jujitsu, it's a great discipleship tool if you're talking about learning how to control your emotions. Learn about getting tapped out. Yeah, learn about <laughs> getting tapped out, giving up, not having your pride kind of yes. rise up. 
and, and all those things that's really good for your spirit and yeah. it's good for your walk with Christ. Like yeah. I find, cause it's like, you have to learn how to submit to Christ too. Yes. The other and, thing for me, yeah. the other thing for me, you know, when you're in pastoral ministry, mm. within the first few years, you don't have any lost friends anymore, mm -hmm. right? You don't, you just don't. Everybody that you're around is at the church, yeah, right? Your your life is at the church and at home, you know? Mm -hmm. You're not a part of any social groups or organizations or any of that stuff. Everybody that you know is a Christian, you know, unless some, you know, person comes to the church or whatever. But when I started training and then competing in BJJ, I had legitimate friendships. Yeah. Intimate friendships. Yes. Because that physical proximity, man. Yeah. You know, all your guards are down, all the, yeah. you know. And I had friends who just, who were lost. And it was incredible, yeah. you know, to be able to be involved in that kind of ministry again. Um, and, and, to, and to have those kinds of relationships again. And it really affected the way that even I preached because I'm thinking about these people, you know, who I'm with multiple times a week yep. and, 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 and who don't believe this stuff and who don't just accept this stuff. And um, so it was really helpful for me in that regard too. I love that. I'm having the same experience right now because uh, I just love it. I love all the people that I get to roll around with. And every week I get to meet someone new. It's a massive class. Yeah. And so I'm getting to know all these non-believers and it's been great. So that's one of the things you do in Zambia. I was, are you going to pick it back up after, you know? The, the, we plan to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we got to find the know. time and then we got to find the place. And Right. Yeah. So, but what else do you do in Zambia? Tell us more about your ministry work in Zambia. So, yeah, we went there, um, believe it or not, eight years ago next month wow. um, to help start the African Christian University. It's a uh, classical Christian liberal arts university um, offering degrees in agriculture, business, education, and uh, theology, and um, looking to move into both fine arts and the hard sciences, um, biology, chemistry, uh, m nursing, you know, health sciences, stuff like that. Um, and it's an unbelievable place in that we have, you know, this commitment to classical education. Like all of our students take Latin their whole first year. Wow. Um, but at the same time, we have a, a student labor program um, where we're teaching biblical work ethic and students having to learn how to work well. Um, so I always tell people it's, it's early Ivy League meets Tuskegee Institute, you know. Oh. Um, and it's been an incredibly fruitful work, um, and, and something that, um, it's, it's been a privilege for me to be a part of, uh, over How the last How many students years. Um, do you guys have? I think right now we're, we're probably broke a hundred now. Oh, wow. wow. Um, yeah. Congratulations. So, yeah. It's been, but it's, it's been good. What are, what are some issues that the church in Zambia faces? We in the U S have hand wringing over many things. Yeah. Does the church in Zambia also worry about diversity quotas? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of the interesting things. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting being not only, you know, an American, but I was born and raised in Los Angeles, but I spent my adult life in, in Texas, mostly in Houston. And a lot of people don't know this, but Houston is the, mo the most <clears throat> ethnically diverse city in America. Not New York, not LA, Houston. Hmm. Wow. And so to go from arguably the most ethnically diverse country in America, the most e ethnically diverse city in mm -hmm. the most ethnically diverse country, to go to Zambia, <laughs> where ethnic diversity is just not a thing, <laughs> um, it was... It was it was it was a bit jarring. If Jared you know? or I went there, would we bring up the ethnic diversity you, by a hundred percent? You would. You would do bring We'd it be up. the diversity bring it up by a lot. You know. If we came there uh, regularly, would you be our Brazilian jiu-jitsu professor? Absolutely. Oh, thank okay, you. Okay, now absolutely. that is a real thing. If, if I go visit <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I want to go to your gym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's it's interesting because we would and I know we keep getting back to this. Like, <laughs> it's interesting because we would have people. Um, they would come to uh, Lusaka. We're in Lusaka, the capital city, and our you know main embassy in that region is in Lusaka. So people would come uh, working 
doing something at the embassy or they would come doing something for some NGO or whatever and they'd find out about us yeah. and they would show up. So we would have people from all kinds of places no you way. Know, to, to, to show up. Um, and so, it's yeah. so cool. But yeah, it's 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 uh it's it's been good. We went there with our seven youngest children. We have nine children. Our seven youngest went there with us, and now um, five out of the seven have spent at least half their life there. Yeah. Wow, time and flies. Yeah. How do you see? Do you, I mean you see this obviously affecting your kids the way they're developing and mm. what they you know they're not growing up as Americans they're yeah. growing up as Africans. It's, there, are, there's you know, actually a word for it. They're yeah. called third culture kids um, because you know our our kids are um, you know they're they're Americans and I've told people you know if 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 living in Lusaka for the last eight years has taught me anything it is that I'm not an African. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so th- we're Americans, but we've spent our last eight years there in, you know, in this other culture. Um, and so it's like we we don't fully um, belong anywhere, especially for the kids, especially for the ones who've been there for, you know, at least half their life. Um, they don't they don't really fully belong in, in either place. Um, and it it's an interesting phenomenon. It, um, you know, can be a blessing and a curse. Mm. Um but it's something that you know we are, are cognizant of. It's something that we sort of you know keep before them and try to help them to think about and to work through, um, and try to help them to look at it as something that the Lord uh, absolutely intended and will use in their lives. We don't know how, mm. um, but you know God doesn't waste anything. Mm. Yeah. He doesn't, does he? You're here in you're here in California today. It's almost like you're talking to an unreached people group. Are you here on missionary support? What brings you on a SoCal tour? Do you yeah. think we're Christians? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Do we fit? Do yeah, we fit yeah. in that um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really interesting when you come to Southern California. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, sometimes uh, when I come to Southern California, I tell people sometimes it's really good for you to just take a look at what God saved you from. Mm. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> seriously, no, no. But seriously, <laughs> I come back to the U.S. four times a year, and and do a about a ten day you know speaking tour. This is still you know sort of primary means of income for me. Mm. Um, it's also a way for us to keep the work in Lusaka in front of people here. Um, so yeah, this is one of those one of those tours, and it just. Uh, we're doing it all in, in SoCal this time. Well, so. when you do come here, your eyes are wide open and you're seeing it with fresh perspective. In your mind, what are the biggest issues the church in America is facing right now? Yeah, I, boy, that's a hard one. And one of the reasons that it's, that it's a hard one, I, and I try to communicate this even to our students there, I, people don't have a sense of how big America is, mm-hmm. Right. There's only two countries with more people, mm-hmm. and, and that's you know China and and, and India. You know, um, other than that, it's us. It's 350 million people, and mm-hmm. you know because we're so big, um, and because of federalism, right? We got 50 states, and I think COVID showed us that mm-hmm. because you know your experience of COVID depended on what state you were in, and I think that's true when it comes to talking about the church as well, right? It kind of depends on where you are, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and because I do these tours in various places, um, my experience is, is, is never the same. So, you know, um, back in January, my tour was in Florida and now here, um, you know, in, in Southern California and very, very different um, experience. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, if you want to talk about areas where more broadly speaking, the American church um, struggles, I think that's one of the struggles mm-hmm. is that there's, for whatever reason, this lack of a sense of the amazing diversity within the body because of the nature of our republic. Hmm. Um, and so not everybody's experience is the same. And and I say that because, you know, a lot of people aren't aware 
of places where things are good, right? And so, for example, a lot of California Christians, you know, they're just like, people are leaving and, you know, the state's just going crazy and yeah. da, 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 And they have a sense that that's American Christianity. Mm. Well, no, it's not. No. You know? Right. It's, it, it's not. Um, there that's are, encouraging to you. Yeah. yeah there, thank you. <laughs> there are places where things are going like gangbusters, you know? Right. Um, and, and that ought to encourage us, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and at the same time, in those places where things are going like gangbusters, you know, we ought to be mindful of the people who are not experiencing that mm-hmm. and, and, and ask ourselves how we can be an encouragement, you know, That's to right. them. Um, you know, so I'm not sure if that was what you were. Yeah. Well, I mean, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one of the major issues that we struggled with, I guess in 2020, it's calmed down a bit now, but it was the racial tension uh, that brought, that came about because of the George Floyd thing. And, yeah. And then that spun off into the church and then CRT started coming into the church and there was a lot of kind of um, blending of philosophical yeah. lines yeah. Um, with with Christianity and with all these other idea- ideologies and neo- yeah. neo-Marxism and stuff. And um, I would, uh, you know, and I, I told you this before we started, but, I, but Fault Lines was hugely uh, impactful for me and for my community. Uh, when I discovered Fault Lines, it, it helped me a ton because I was dealing with that I'm in church leadership, so dealing dealing with that was really difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, can you speak to that just a little bit? Like how, first of all, what what drove you to write Fault Lines? Like how did this start for you? And then uh, and then out of that, how, how has it been used over the last couple of years? And have you seen a change? Have you seen a difference in the church? Yeah. Well, um, it's it, Fault Lines was really interesting because I had been um, teaching on these things for a decade or more. Mm. And um, had had started on a number of occasions to work on um, this this kind of book, but when all of these things happened, when, when all the George Floyd stuff happened, and um, again living in Zambia and hearing Zambians talk about you know the American police, and you need to understand something in in, in Zambia, um, you know the police set up stops on the side of the road where you know, they, they, they have these checkpoints where they look for violations and, um, and then you have to pay your fine in Uh, cash on the side of the road. Like right there. Yeah. Right there. (laughs) Um, we're in a store one day and we hear this guy howling, right. And he's being beaten and carried out on the shoulders of some, you know, guys and be beaten by, by the police. And uh, some Zambians saw us looking with our mouths agape, you know, and they looked at us and they go, Oh, he's a thief. Like, you know, he it, deserves it. Yeah, it's, it's okay. okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. he's a real jerk. He's a thief. Due know? process okay. yeah, right. yeah, by baton. Okay. Yeah. okay. Like we were supposed to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so, you know. yes. oh, oh you should have said it. so. And so, for when Zambians, when our Zambian students hmm. started talking about you know policing in America and all this kind of stuff, I was like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> you know, that's enough. Uh, America is one of, if not the least racist country in the world. Um, as, as well as being one of, if not the most ethnically diverse country in the world. And I mean, I, I always tell people I love it when the Olympics come around because when the Olympics come around, most other countries, you can tell who their athletes are because they all look the same. Yeah. In America, we've got athletes who look like everybody else's country, mm. right? <laughs> <That's true. laughs> because we are this incredible mm. um, ethnically diverse, you know, melting pot. And it, it Again, there's racism all over the place because of the wicked, you know, heart of man. But the man, this this narrative was so false, mm-hmm. and I just felt like um, I had an opportunity, um, I had a window, um, and I had a platform to be able to say something to speak into that moment. So it was it was more of a stewardship. And a burden, yeah. You know, um, than like I guess else. I'm the guy to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just. The, if the propaganda got so out of control, it was in Zambia. I guess that was a, a spur. I I remember when reading it, it crystallized my thoughts as well. Similar experience to Jarrett. I knew which way I was leading, but leaning. But I needed thought leadership to settle me. I I was struck by your combination of data with anecdotal, with then just deconstructing the facts of each of the high profile cases. On the anecdotal side, your testimony 
was beautiful. Frances sounded like sounds like quite a woman. And then the gentleman. <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah. That well, a can lot. can you tell us yeah. more about your testimony? Not all of our audience knows you. Yeah. There's overlap. Tell us about how you came to Christ. Yeah. So um, again, I grew up in 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 L.A. South Central L.A. Um, my mother uh, was became pregnant with me when she was you know 17. I was born when she was 18. Um, her and my father, you know, I was born in 1969, you know, back then, you know, what you did was you got married hmm. and I think they stayed married, stayed together for a year or two. So I was raised by a, a single teenage mother who was a practicing Buddhist. Hmm. Um, and you know, I never, I never heard the gospel till I got to university. And, uh, you know, when I got old enough to find a little trouble in South Central or, or for trouble to find me, um, my mother shipped me out, hmm. and we moved. Got on a Greyhound bus. It was it was like a three day trip from mm. Los Angeles to Beaufort, South Carolina, hmm. where I spent the next year living with my uncle, who's a retired drill instructor in the Marine Corps. You got in one little fight, and your mama got scared. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you went to live with your uncle yeah, in Beaufort, that. South Carolina. Yeah, well, Thank you. Yeah. That was well done. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but, uh, yeah. So it was, it was, yeah, it was that. And and again, my mother just, um, I'm, gr- I'm so grateful, you know, um, for her and for uh, her 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 care for me, her her wisdom in all of that, and her diligence in all of that. Um, you know, after that, I went to, you know, San Antonio and went to high school there, and um, um, again came to faith in college. Um, I I. Um, yeah, so that that was. Well, I was encouraged that evangelism worked. It was an average guy. I mean, some of us were evangelizing faithfully to friends, family, and strangers, and we don't always see the fruit of it. But to hear your story, where a gentleman approached you, walked you through the four spiritual yeah. laws, then decided he's not ready for this, backed up and yep. said, "This is a Bible," yep. and then yep. really like broke it down. Yep. I, I was hugely encouraged by seeing evangelism work. Yeah, yeah, it's Amen. really cool. Yeah, so back a little bit back to fault lines and being who mm-hmm. you are, came, you know, who you came from. And by the way, yeah. that whole thing, you know, with with my story, those first two chapters, a lot of people were like, yeah, it's great, you know, you did those first two chapters so that, you know, you could establish your bona fides and whatever. And I'm like, you know, you know to, to a certain extent, as I was writing that, um, I knew that those first two chapters um, w- would be completely dismissed um, by by the you know CRT um, you know um, neo Marxist mm, yeah. you know culture it completely it completely dismissed and I thought it would be ba- valuable on both fronts right uh-huh. I thought it'd be valuable for people who said oh wait a minute this guy actually does have some sort of context here. Um, and it would also be valuable to demonstrate the fact that people who talk about listening to black voices are liars, <laughs> Yeah, right? They're liars. What they mean is listen to black voices who agree with us. Yeah. Listen to black voices who say yeah. what we think black voices ought to say, which is incredibly racist. It's so racist. You know? Yeah, Listen to black voices that... Are they said they would call you a white voice or like some kind of internalized racism, yes. or something like that? Yeah, yes, yeah. That's interesting. That's it's terrible because they just always dismiss people. Um, but should should Christians? I mean, you obviously wrote this book. Should should we be concerned about fighting the culture war, engaging with the culture in this way? Um, what do you think? Yeah. So here, I think we need to be faithful wherever we find ourselves. There we go. I I did. This I wrote fault lines because, for me, in my position, um, it was fitting. It, it was it was a fitting contribution for me. It was not me trying to be something that I wasn't. It was not me trying to you know gain entree into some place that I didn't belong. It was me being faithful with mm. what I had, and so I, I think that that that's the way we need to think about it, right? Mm-hmm. I think, unfortunately, for many Christians, they look at um, somebody like me, or they look at the Babylon Bee, or they look at, you know, John MacArthur or whoever, fill in the blank, and they say, that's 
what it means to engage. Therefore, I have to do what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so they they either try to become something that they're not, or they get frustrated and feel like they don't matter. And you know, and and instead, I, I think we need to have a little. I like to call it Moses theology, right? Um, God could have just parted the Red Sea, right? He could have just said, "Turn around, I'm getting ready to do something." But he says, "What's that in your hand?" Mm. And he uses oh. what Moses has in his hand, right? And I, I think that's what he does with us. And I, I'm just always trying to ask myself, what's in my hand? In my what has he given me? What do I have? Mm. Um, and I think I think that's when we're most effective. I, we need to have an altar call right now. Yes, yeah, that's encouraging. <laughs> no, honestly, it's it's really encouraging. I think that's speaking directly to my spirit. You don't even know. Yeah. S- stewardship and faithfulness are two yeah. words you've used that I'll latch on to because that seems to be the way we should think of politics. We're stewarding a vote. Absolutely. We're not worshiping it. Now, getting into politics and broader, you know, all things Dr. Yeah. Bauckham, there's three funny things that you're not scared of. Uh, you know, you don't have handlers telling you don't talk about this. Leaders don't have handlers. The three things are, number one, patriarchy, and you call it gospel patriarchy. Number two, Christian nationalism. You haven't shied away from the term. And then number three, you'll still do events with Grandpa Doug. Yeah. Doug Wilson. Oh. (laughs) So so what's your approach to- He was just sitting there. What's your approach to things that are uh, potentially incendiary and not being fearful about tackling them biblically? Yeah. I, I think that goes back to this same principle. I'm not trying to be- somebody that I'm not. I, I'm I'm just being me. And I'm just trying to be faithful and stay in my lane, right? Um and and you know when it comes to the whole, you know, patriarchy deal, when I've been writing about that and you talk about gospel patriarchy, I think I, I used that phrase the first time in in Family Shepherds, you know? And um, you know, of course it wasn't n- nearly as um, uh, the hot button then that it is today. And, you know, so, I mean, I'm, it's, it's not like I tried to find, you know, some term to be <laughs> controversial. I'm sure I was trying to be clear. Right. And I think that the term is clear. I use the term because it's biblical and because it's clear. Mm. Um, now, now if I'm honest, right, just between us, <laughs> um, and, 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 and just yeah, just, just between us. Here. <laughs> we um, won't tell. <laughs> it's a bit of my personality here. When I find out that people are up in arms because of something like that, I, I'm even more incentivized, <laughs> right? I, I'm even more incentivized. Yeah. So even if I was thinking about using another terminology, I'm definitely not going to do it now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Now, now, because you're not going to bully me, you know, into doing that. Um, you know, and then in terms of you'd fit uh, in at the B, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not easily bullied, absolutely. And then, yeah, yeah, um, and then in terms of you know, Christian nationalism, um, that that was another thing, right? Like, I never used the term you know, Christian nationalism, I've never identified myself as Christian nationalism. But the point that I've made is that when the pushback came, right, and you know, I like to think that fault lines was part of the pushback, mm-hmm. you know. When the pushback came and when people who had been, um, you know, sort of flirting with um, some of this CRT, you know, neo-Marxist kind of ideology, um, when they got that pushback, um, what they didn't do was they didn't say, okay, you got me. We were wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, as far as I don't, I don't, I don't know anybody, you know, that that's done that. There that's wasn't true. an apology there tour. There wasn't an apology tour, right? Oh, that's there, true. There was not a "we led you astray." There was not. There was. There was not. There was not any of that. Um, but what happened with some of them is they just went underground, and I guess just hoped that you know the interwebs that don't forget anything would forget that. Hmm. Um, and then others begin to say, look over there, Christian nationalism, hmm. right? Hmm. And I, I think most of us, most of the people that I've talked to, when people started talking about that a couple of years ago, yep. our first response was, 
What? Okay, what is that? <laughs> what is, I had that thought. Yeah, tell me, tell me. <laughs> I mean, guys, what do you mean? I mean, I you know, I could be. Uh, yeah. you know what I mean, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? No, the biggest church, the biggest problem is Christian nationalism. It's yeah. not this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a lot of lawyers. And then yeah. people were like, well, yeah, you guys are all you know on this CRT stuff, but you're not saying anything about Christian nationalism, yeah. right? And so my response was, hmm. you know, well, point me in the direction, yeah. you know. Um, and it was sort of nebulous and, you know, and the definition was they would malleable. They always point to Jack Hibbs. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the definition was malleable. That's true. Um, and then a lot of the things that they were, were, were pointing at, um, boy, they, they, they seem pretty like biblical and, um, yeah, so it was, it was really interesting. So, mm -hmm. Again, I wasn't going to shy away from that because I saw it as a tactic, right? I I saw this as the next play, you know? It was, we feel like we're about to be checkmated, you know, um, and and we're going to do something drastic, mm. you know? Um, so, yeah, I was not going to run away from that. Um, but, at, you know, and then on the last one, you know, with, with Doug, um, yeah. I have many friends um, with whom I disagree on things. And one of the things I love about honest biblical Christianity, one of the things I love about manly pastors, elders, is that we're okay disagreeing with one another. Mm -hmm. You don't have to line up with me on everything, right? If we line up on, you know, essential things and, and important things. Um, and the, the other thing that I'm not going to do, because again, this is another ploy, right? The minute I say, now listen, we've, we've all got standards, okay? Uh, let, let me just put that out there, right? We've all got standards. There's places that I'm that I'm that I'm that I'm not going um unless it's clear that you know I'm 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 going as a hostile witness you know yeah. um but 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 having said that I'm not going to to fall into the trap of being a person who says I'm only going to do events with people who are you know completely and utterly with me and people who I endorse, you know, completely everything. Cause the minute that I do that right now, all of a sudden it's, you were there, they did that. Right. Right. Because you say, you know, that that's your, st that must mean that you know that that's, that's not the case. Right. Now specifically, what, what would be a standard that you'd be like, well, I can't really mm -hmm. like, would it be a Jen hat maker? Mm -hmm. Or like a Richard Rohr or something like that. You'd be like, nah, those guys aren't even Christians. It would like, depend like, yeah. on it would depend on what it was. Yeah. If it was a situation where I could get in there and, you know, be unfettered, um I tell you, I give you I'll give you an example. Um going on the blaze. Okay. The Glenn Beck interview. Um, and going on with Glenn Beck. I yeah. saw that. You know, I've been with Glenn Beck a number of times. There are no restraints put on me. I can communicate the gospel. Mm -hmm. I can be, you know, free and bold. And, you know, and, and he and I have a relationship behind the scenes and off the camera. And, you know, I'm I'm grateful to the Lord mm -hmm. for for all for all of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because of who I am and because of this commitment that I have, you know, you, you can't say, oh, he's going on there, so therefore he must dot, dot, dot. No, that's absolutely not the case. Yeah. But when there is a platform, and I'm not going to be muzzled, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've gone on CNN. Um, that didn't go well for them, so I haven't been, <laughs> <laughs> invited, I haven't been invited back. Um, but you know, I do. I I do those kinds of things, um, and so you know that that's the one side of it. But the other side of it, let me get back to where I was. The other side of it is I value friendship. Mm. You know, and Doug Wilson is a friend. Mm -hmm. um, he's he he's a friend and a brother, and we you know disagree on things, and you know all of this kind of stuff, but. Real friendship can handle that, yeah. you know. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that actually, because we're, yeah, we're in relationship with a lot of people of, you know, different mindsets. You mentioned Glenn Beck and, uh, you know, the Harmon brothers, they're, they're Mormons too. And we're friends with them yeah. and we're friends with Doug Wilson. We're friends with, um, you know, a lot of other folks too. And, and even, even some charismatics, you know. And you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was great. You mentioned Glenn Beck at the Blaze. It just, it sparked yeah. in my mind. I remember he made a clip right after uh, they axed Tucker and he said that his suspicion was they were, you know, a spooked by how he was willing to say, talk about spiritual things and, you know, say, this is demonic and yeah. this is anti-God. Yeah. And I, I bet he, I bet he appreciated that because he said that from the very top brass, he would get notes and missives saying, you're being, you're talking about God way too much on your show. Yeah. So he doesn't muzzle you. Well, he's an interesting guy. Cause I mean, you know, he did um, Nefarious, that movie we just, we just did. The Steve and Deese movie. The Steve Deese, yeah. He, he did you see that movie? No, we were just talking about. You guys got to see it. Well, yeah. there's there's one part in it where uh, there's a really brilliant actor that Jared tells Tenet, the main the character where the phone is. Okay. You need to make sure you don't blink. Okay. Uh, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> All right. You'll see. You may recognize him. <laughs> All right. But there is. Uh, but Glenn Beck is really cool because he went. He got behind all these Christians uh, to do this thing. Yeah. You know, and that was this combination of people. I mean, Chuck and Carrie, the two main guys, they're Catholics and mm -hmm. the, you know, obviously Glenn's a Mormon. And then you have, you know, Steve Dace, who's an evangelical. And yeah. And uh, so really, really a good combination of people. The same thing with the chosen and that kind of stuff too. But um, anyway, I, I think I agree with you. And I think that's something that we need to remind ourselves of. But see, that's it. It's important. See, that's a, that's another deal. You asked me about my line. You, you said yeah. the chosen. That's a line you that's draw. A, that's a line I draw. Yeah. Have you seen The Chosen? Have you no. watched it? Yeah, I'm two watching. CV, man. Second two CV. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're a two no, CV four guy. CV. Gotcha. No, two CV. Yeah. Gotcha. So, you okay. know. Gotcha. So, yeah, I do. that. You, again, you asked about my lines. That's yeah, one that's of my lines. Line. You know? Um, and that, 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 that series portraying there. Jesus as idolatry or portraying Jesus as yeah, a, portraying a graven Jesus image. Yeah, portraying Jesus as idolatry and, yeah. and, and, and you know, I get some of the, yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. Speaking of- sure. Speaking of folks not being muzzled, when Pastor John went on with Ben Shapiro for the Sunday special, Pastor John MacArthur, I think he had a similar philosophy where he said, we're not aligned, but Ben Shapiro is not going to muzzle me. So right. I'm going to preach the gospel. And he did. Yeah, it was right. beautiful. He preached from Isaiah 53. Right. Pretty fitting. Right. Yeah. Dr. Bauckham, we're both huge fans of you, as you can tell. One of the things that I really like is your tone control. And I don't just mean you have a deep voice. I mean, when you're preaching. But you do you have, have a deep voice. But you do. Yeah, we, we don't <laughs> just love you for, uh, we don't just love soothing. you for BJJ <laughs> reasons and bench press reasons and deep yeah. voice. We appreciate you that your books. preaching is, uh, it, it's more than just rhetoric. I just wanted to ask you a big picture question. What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Boy. I, I I think from a from a biblical perspective, there's not a lot of difference. I think from a modern understanding um, that people would say that um, that there is a difference, but I think that that difference has to do with the fact that we've created a lot of venues. Um, a lot of non pulpit oriented venues. Mm. Um, so for example, Sunday school, right? Um, you know, Jesus didn't go to Sunday school. Mm. Um, so I, I think because of that, um, we now have these, these venues where, um, th there's a difference between the authority of the pulpit, right? Um, and the, um, uh, expositional proclamation of the word with the authority of the pulpit and um, teaching opportunities that are not that. So uh, can you preach on a podcast, for example? Like right now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Will you preach for us oh, right yeah. now? <laughs> Do <Yeah>. a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, go. <laughs> well, well, it seems like your book- and make it funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Your, That's your book, good. Expositional Apologetics, This seems that seems to be the entire basis of it is that you're always preaching if you're yeah. appealing to texts yes. and then the spirit is working through you. Yeah, and, and always doing apologetics. Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting because- I think in fault lines, it's in, it's a, it's pretty clear. And I, I run into it. There's a lot of, there's kind of a movement in culture where people sort of identify as a particular type of Christian first. 
mm-hmm. uh, or they identify with something other than Christ, and then they identify as a Christian mm-hmm. after that. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? I know that people like, hey, I'm a conservative Christian, I'm a progressive Christian, I'm a black Christian, I'm a white Christian, mm-hmm. I'm a gay Christian. Like people have all these like things that they say. Um, can you just speak to that? What is it to be a Christian? Can mm-hmm. you just define what Christianity is? What is it to follow Christ? For yeah, those people quite, listening? quite simply, um, I would say that being a Christian means a, being a, a Christ follower. It means being someone who is uh, redeemed, mm-hmm. um, means someone who is trusting Christ and Christ alone for the pardon of their sins um, and living in light of that trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I, I mean, yeah. As far as um, the adjectives that we use, as far as um, you know, those those modifiers and clarifiers, uh, I think it depends, mm. right? I, I, sometimes those can be very helpful, you know. Um, at other times, it, as you say, it's it's wearing another label more proudly than we wear the label Christian, mm. um, and it it's interesting because. Every once in a while, I don't spend a lot of time on on social media, um, and you know there are certain people who show remain nameless <laughs> get on to me for not doing a better job of anyway. Um, but I, I just I don't I just don't, I don't spend a lot. Are of they time. in the room? Is it they, is they it Jay? Be, they could be. <laughs> they 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 could be. In Jay the room. is Doctor Buckham's main staffer, and Makes you know sense. part of the reason I don't is because. You know, my heart issues and my blood pressure and, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. It messes um, with your blood pressure. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. yep. but um, I, I, I chuckle, you know, because sometimes people will find out, for example, that I'm a Calvinist. Yeah. And they'll be like, wait, what? You know, him too? Yeah. To which I have two responses. A two, Brute? Yeah, to which I have two responses. Number one, where you been? Right. Um, <laughs> much about you. Yeah, wait, where you? Where you been? Um, you know, but but number two, it's that same kind of thought, right? I don't, you know, I don't make a habit of going around saying mm-hmm. I'm this kind of, mm. you know, um, which goes back to what we talked about earlier, the the relationships that we can have, the the, the broader, you know, relationships that we can have with people and. Uh, advantage, you know, opportunities that we can take advantage of. Um, I mean, I don't hide any of that, mm. right? And I think when people find that out, um, they often have that kind of, you know, M. Night Shyamalan reveal moment. Yeah. You know, <laughs> look back and they go, wait! It was dead the whole wait. time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, spoilers, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Well, it was so... Dead the whole time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, that's uh, funny. Well... Okay, that's that is really interesting. Yeah. I forgot what my follow up question was on that, but well, we'll yeah. we'll stay on the topic yeah. um, because I I think this oh. is maybe oh go ahead. You know, maybe you're gonna ask. No, you question. go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, why should I be a Calvinist? <laughs> is that what you're gonna ask? No, but that's funny. Okay, yeah, explain. explain. <laughs> no, no, but Miss that's me. funny. <laughs> <laughs> that be, no, but that's funny. Go with that one. Go. No, with that that's one. good. That's yeah. funnier. Yeah. Explain John Calvin. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. One, two, three, what, go. A, what a hoot, <laughs> what a hoot <laughs> he was. Yeah. Why should yeah. Jared be a Calvinist? Yeah. Go ahead and make the case no, if you don't, I don't mind. I don't think he can make it. I don't think, yeah. <laughs> I'm not in. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Well, yeah. I'll ask my question then. Maybe it's we'll come gonna, back to Calvinism. I'm not called to be a Calvinist. Yeah. I just, yeah. I'm not predestined for it. Yeah, right? I don't, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask, <laughs> okay. I mean, speaking of- I get of, it, I get it. Speaking of blood pressure, speaking of the perennial temptation to let other things become your main identity, we mentioned Tucker a couple moments ago. I think Christians who are serious about the truth are going to be attracted to certain parts of Tucker, but then he'll get them whipped up and riled up and their yeah. blood pressure will go through the roof. And then before they know it, you know, myself included, we'll end up putting that above Christ. We'll end right. up fighting and culture warring. So here's my question. There's there's two approaches. There's the fighting and the culture warring, but then there's also those who, Jared mentioned this when we were doing our Dr. Bauckham prep call uh, on Friday. He said there seem to be Christians who fetishize persecution and who who don't want to steward their vote responsibly. Of those two branches, um, what's the healthy middle ground of culture warring and then, hey, we just need to get persecuted because it'll make us feel holier? Is there a middle ground there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the middle ground there is to go back to what we were talking about. And um, 
and, and here's my here's my my Calvinism coming out coming <laughs> out again. Calvin, He's bringing it all in. Here, here's, here's my Calvinism. He's working BJJ as well. <laughs> um, it is about being faithful where we are, mm. right? And if I'm being faithful where I am, and I am, you know, living out my Christian walk. And I'm being responsible in all three spheres, right? He's given us the family. He's given us the church. Mm. He's given us the civil government. If I'm being faithful in those three spheres and I am effectively living out my Christian convictions in those three spheres, then number one, it is going to be inevitable that I'm going to do some culture warring, mm. right? There we go. Um, because if they hated Christ, they will hate us. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, faithfulness in those three spheres will lead me to the battle. Mm -hmm. And number two, when I'm led to the battle, I will get my persecution on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, that that's that you know, uh Second Timothy three twelve, all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted, right? So I don't think we go looking for one of those things or the other. Um, I think as we live out our Christian lives, um, seeking, you know, as much as it depends on us to be at peace with all men, mm -hmm. right? Seeking to live peaceful and quiet lives, um, but being faithful to our Lord and working to advance the kingdom, mm -hmm. um, it, both of those things will be inevitable. Mm. Yeah, it does seem like we'll live out our Christian faith. It holds up a mirror to the culture, shows them where the sins are. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get into the Babylon Bee for any amount of time, uh, <laughs> it's a prophetic voice in the sense that it calls, it shows the, the culture what's going on in the culture. And mm -hmm. so people get very angry about it. Mm -hmm. So persecution, I don't know, that's a, that's a word, marginalization or... Yeah, we do stir up the. We're pot, reviled, and, you know. That's reviled. a word. People yeah. do hate us, you know. Yep. Um, when we stand up and say things, and there's times where we stand up and say things, like you know, you, you wrote fault lines because it was the time. Yeah. To write it, you knew you were supposed to write it, and I feel like we have that same calling. It's like we know it's our time to say, "Nah, that's too far." <laughs> yeah. Not with the kids, you know. Like, let's mm. stop that. Yeah. yeah. So that is interesting. And to do it, and to do it the way you do it. Yeah. You know, to use. What's in your hand? Mm -hmm. That's right. That was I, encouraging, Jared. I, the guys that sit on the sidelines and, and laugh at everybody else. <laughs> That's in my hand. No, but that was a good... <laughs> we should clip your speech and like edit your Murica shirt on. Murica. Murica. <laughs> this, is a, this is a huge... I mean, I think there's a temptation uh, among people who aren't saved but are conservatives to feel black-pilled. To me, this is a white pill. Should Christians feel fear? going into this coming season? What emotion should Christians predominantly feel? Yeah, so again, we we serve the king of glory. Of whom should we be afraid, right? Mm. Like, no, we should not we should not fear. Um we we walk in faith, mm. not fear. Um so whatever it is that we're doing, right? Um because we serve the one true and living God. Mm -hmm. And because, as I've often said, you know, God's not running for God. Right? <laughs> um, That's true. That's good. We're we're not we're not afraid. Mm -hmm. We're not afraid. We trust. Mm -hmm. We trust. And you know? and like at the end of the Joseph narrative, um, man is working for evil, but out of evil, God can bring forth good. I yeah. think even in persecution, God can bring forth more good than we could even foresee. Even in death. Even in death. Even in death. And the last time I checked, the death rate was one per person. <laughs> That's right. right? So we're all headed that way. Yeah. Wow. We're all going there. Wow. Well, that's incredible. I think that's encouraging for us as the bee as well. I think going into our What, things. that you're going to die? <laughs> 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 One per person. Yes. yes. Go ye therefore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ye therefore and tell funny jokes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that is interesting. It's encouraging because I think we're going into, we're you know, we're wading into culture war. We get a lot of, you know kick back it seems yeah. same as you and when you're speaking and yeah. speaking truth it's and and sometimes it's brought to us yeah right and you know we're talking about being here in southern california i mean gavin newsom is at war with the church yeah in many ways right he's at war with conservatives he's at war with you know mm -hmm. that man is he's on the rampage right yeah. he is at war so you know we don't have to go looking for, 
you know, for, for, for trouble. Um, yeah. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations and settings and places and times um, where it's unavoidable. You're, you lent your voice and face and presence to the Essential Church documentary from Grace Community Church about Pastor John MacArthur's lawsuit against Newsom, and the encouragement there was that he won. Um, what about when Christians don't? What about when the state does temporarily prevail, the godless state? Yeah. Again, um, when, we, when we believe in um, firmly the sovereignty of God— um, and, and, and when we believe that, you know, everything happens because of God's decree mm. and that God executes his decrees and his works of creation and providence, then, you know, we, we, we know that he is working all things mm-hmm. um, according to his plan, according to his will. Um, and so we trust, you know. Yeah. I heard the word sovereignty and providence. Yes. We're getting there. We're planting seeds. Okay. Those are the only two words I heard, actually. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't listening to the rest. Sam planted, uh, Dr. No, Bacham watered. I'm totally kidding. Um, no, but let's... Uh, this is this is super encouraging. I, w- I want to know... W- there's two two questions I have for you. First, will you be our mentors? <laughs> and, can you be my professor for BJJ? No, those, are the, those are the two. And then the second question is, what's next for Bodhi Bacham? What's going on with you? Boy. Um, yeah, a couple of things. One, we're finishing up this 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 tour here and um we got a few more stops before we we end next week in in bakersfield and um and then there is a a revised and updated um publication of my first book the ever loving truth um which is coming out in september um the subtitle of that is can faith thrive in a post-christian culture Mm. and it was amazing to sort of you know walk back through that um, it, it, uh, it came out in 2004. So we're right at, um, you know, almost 20 years now. Wow. Um, and wow. it was really amazing to look back at that and see, you know, how, how relevant that still is. Um, and then next year, Lord willing, uh, for pride month, I have another book coming out. Oh, cool. And the title of that is it's not like being black. <laughs> oh, yes, that is a good title. Oh, I love celebrating Pride Month like that. Oh, that's, that's... <laughs> oh, and before we do go behind the paywall, Wrath and Grace is the app. Oh. Anything else we you should promote? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you want to know about Wrath and Grace, you mm-hmm. can go to wrathandgrace.com. <laughs> yeah, and you can uh, get the app there. Dot and, gov. Yes, no. That, dot com. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful partners. You know, we partner with Wrath and Grace for our, the tours that we do quarterly. Very cool. If you want to know about ACU? ACU Zambia. Dot com, um, and that that's a way that you can sort of connect with us. What is what does ACU out. stand for? African Christian University. And the book is Fault Lines. If you guys haven't read this book yet. Uh, I think it's kind of a seminal work on the church and and critical race theory. It's a really good opportunity to engage the conversation from a person that really knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. So uh, read it. It was it was pretty impactful for me, and I think for Likewise. Sam as well. We also just came and, uh, out with a ten part video series to su- to support it. Yeah, we got the ten part si- video series for um, fault lines. Where can you find that? You can find that at Salem Now. Salem Now. Okay. All these Salem, Salem isn't afraid to take the high heat when it comes no, to it publishing yeah. spicy books. No, they're not. They're not. Spicy. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No Fifty Shades yep. of Grey, but you know, <laughs> that kind of spicy. Uh, <laughs> not that kind. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's uh, let's uh, go to the subscriber portion. Coming up next for Babylon Bee subscribers. Christianity in this culture is seen as the hegemonic power that facilitates the oppression. But those same people who said enough still think same-sex marriage is fine. I think my church has Folgers. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> it's the worst. It's if it's like, got- it's, we call it brown sadness water. <laughs> <laughs> so we call it. This has been another edition of the Babylon Bee Podcast. From the dedicated team of certified fake news journalists you can trust here at the Babylon Bee, reminding you that an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. <laughs>